Good morning. My name is Dr. Nusrat Khalili, and today I will talk to you about our global water crisis. This is the first of a series of four seminars. My next three seminars are about conserving water inside your home, conserving water outside your home, and the water conservation rebate program San Valley Water offers to help you fund your water conservation projects. The goal of these seminars is to make you aware of the water shortage we are having in our community and around the world and what actions you can take to reduce your water bill and make our community sustainable. This lecture is timely. In fact, our governor, Gavin Newsom, just declared drought emergency in two counties, Mendocino and Sonoma County. This is a Bay Area Older Adults presentation, which I will call BAO for short. BAO is a nonprofit organization that improves the health and well being of more than 42,000 adults age 50 plus each year through educational, outdoors, and social programs. To get an idea of how much you already know, what causes water stress? So water stress is caused by all of the above, insufficient amount of water, pollution, geopolitical issues, inadequate in infrastructure. So it is all of the above. This is an outline of what I'm going to cover in my talk today. First, I will give you an overall perspective or context for the global water crisis. Then I'm going to focus on one of the major issues, that is water stress. And lastly, I'll give you a summary of the issues we have covered today. In 2015, world leaders agreed to 17 global goals, no, officially known as the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. It is now six years on, and we have more work than ever to do. These goals have the power to create a better world by 2030, by ending poverty, fighting inequality, and addressing the urgency of climate change. Guided by these goals, it is now up to all of us, governments, businesses, civil society, and the general public, to work together to build a better future for everyone. Successful water management will serve as a foundation for the achievement of many of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, as well as for SDG 6, which is to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. When we think about the global water crisis, we think about populations living through drought in arid parts of the world. Water stress is a part of six major challenges that affect the future of water management. Water stress is the first of the six issues we will discuss. Water stress means you have insufficient water in terms of quality and quantity that is accessible water to meet the water demand. It could be due to physical shortage, inaccessibility due to inadequate infrastructure, or poor quality due to pollution. Now, California has its own water stress problems. In 2014, NASA's GRACE satellite data of San Joaquin Valley groundwater shows the draining of aquifers in red. Pumping has taken increasing amounts of groundwater with withdrawals during dry years exceeding the repl replenishment during wet years. 
the deep irrigation wells lowered groundwater levels already 250 meters below the surface in places, putting it out of reach for shallower wells that provide thousands of people with drinking water. So we have since taken some measures to address groundwater depletion. Firstly, we have the Groundwater Management Act of 2014. That's a new law and set up new government agencies to stabilize groundwater levels and plan for sustainability. Um, there are other measures that have been and can be taken. Shifting planting to the most productive lands while leaving some fields fallow during droughts. Reducing irrigated cropland by 10%, creating percolation ponds and flooding farm fields when water is plentiful. And this one I thought was interesting. Creating new man-made aquifers in carefully researched areas by pumping water into the ground instead of removing it. Researchers have identified areas ripe for groundwater recharge based on factors such as soil type, land use, and aquifer geology using geophysical techniques. 1.5 million hectares identified by a UC Davis team may be able to drain 60 times as much water than average sites. This was discovered using a helicopter mounted instrument that sends electromagnetic signals into the ground measuring the electrical properties of buried sediment to create 3D maps of geologic formations that are as much as 300 meters deep. The maps can help managers identify areas where water will quickly soak in, avoiding ponding that can lead to crop diseases and undermine trees. Now, another reason for water stress is geopolitical. 60% of fresh water comes from the river basins that cross, cross national borders. Crown's boundary water agreements need to be robust enough to deal with increasing uncertain environmental and climactic conditions and social and demographic changes that will raise global population to 9.7 billion by 2050 and double the number of people who live in urban areas. Now, Congress passed the Safe Drinking Water Act in 1974. Under its authority, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, has established the protective drinking water standards for more than 90 contaminants, and this is to strengthen public health protection. Over 92% of the population supplied by community water systems receives drinking water that meets all health-based standards all of the time. There are some community water systems and private wells that do not meet all the health and safety standards. I read a story about Florencia Ramos, a farm worker and mother of four who lives in Central Valley town of El Rancho. Once a week, she makes a special trip to a small store in Lindsay, California. She has been purchasing jugs of water at the small store for more than a decade now. At first, she was concerned that the county well water that flowed through her tap contained high levels of disinfection byproducts formed from chlorine used to kill dangerous organisms in drinking water. While it never tasted bad, she recalls her water service provider instructing her not to drink it. Over the years, she watched as people in her community fell in ill. One woman died of cancer, another succumbed to kidney disease. Ramos can't be sure the dirty water was to blame, but she is suspicious and continues to buy bottled water for drinking and cooking. And it is not cheap, buying water at the market costs her some $30 a month on top of her approximately $130 a month tap water bill, not to mention the time lost in making the weekly trips. 
Across the U.S., drinking water systems serving millions of people fail to meet state and federal safety standards. Millions more Americans may be drinking unsafe water without anyone knowing because, firstly, the contaminant limits set by the EPA are too high, or two, contaminants it contains may be unregulated, or three, their drinking water source is too small to fit under EPA regulations. The nitrate and disinfection byproducts that worry Ramos represent a fraction of the many chemical and biological pollutants that find their way into drinking water systems through agricultural runoff, discharge from industry, aging pipes, and all the stuff that flush down our toilet sinks, showers, and washing machines. So modern management and treatment technologies provide clean water for most Americans. Yet, in a given year, between 7 and 8 percent of community water utilities report at least one health-based violation of federal standards. The second big water issue is water sanitation and hygiene, also called WASH. It is the Sustainable Development Goal 6. Out of 7.9 billion world population, 5.3 billion have safe drinking water, 1.5 billion have basic water services but not safe drinking water, and almost 800 million have no basic water services. A basic water service is defined as water that is supplied through an improved water source that can be collected within 30 minutes. Examples of improved water source include a household connection, a public standpipe, a borehole well, a protected spring, and rainwater collection. More than 2 billion people do not have safe drinking water or basic sanitation. Basic sanitation is described as having access to facilities for safe disposal of human waste, feces and urine, as well as having the ability to maintain hygienic conditions through services such as garbage collection, industrial hazardous waste management, and wastewater treatment and disposal. Globally, 80% of industrial and municipal wastewater goes untreated into our waterways, contaminating the little fresh water we do have. Two billion people out of almost eight billion. That's almost 25%. Now, sanitation problems are found around the world and in the United States. I read this story about Pamela Rush in Lowndes County, Alabama. The wheels are still attached to the house trailer that Pamela Rush calls home, but the 49-year-old mother of two is trapped. A lifelong resident of Lowndes County, Alabama, she lives off disability checks, struggling to pay the bills on a ninth grade education. It's hard to attribute her situation to any one cause. She was born in one of the poorest counties in one of the poorest states, and like the rest of the county's mostly African-American population, she wrestles with the legacy of slavery and, the, and systemic discrimination. Just down the road from her home are the sharecroppers' quarters where she was born. Yet the most immediate source of Russia's troubles is the puddle of sewage that has collected in her backyard, brewing with human feces. Whenever the toilet inside is flushed, the waste travels through a 10-foot pipe straight to her backyard. Thousands of the county's residents are in the same situation. Local government won't pay to build the infrastructure to connect them to proper waste disposal lines. So uh, they are left to deal with the myriad problems caused by living in sewage that bubbles up into showers and bathtubs. A 2017 study of the county's residents found that 34% of participants suffer from hookworm, a parasitic infection contracted by walking barefoot on soil contaminated with fecal matter. Among the issues associated with the disease is slow development of children. Next, let's talk about 
the third big water issue, that is water infrastructure deterioration. First, a little history about water supply and infrastructure. Beginning in Boston in the mid 1600s, cities constructed water systems made from lead pipes, primarily for fire protection in newly forming urban areas. Most of these systems were ultimately adapted to supply water to commercial and residential properties uh, between about 1879 and 1900. Also, untreated water supplies had been sickening people with pathogens like typhoid and cholera. So in the early 20th century, the practice of filtering and disinfecting water began. Over the years, scientists were increasingly recognizing the threat of toxic byproducts of water treatment, chemicals from growing industrial sources, many of which posed risks over long periods of time as opposed to the acute effects of waterborne illness. A key piece of legislation protecting our drinking water, however, is the Safe Drinking Water Act. Congress passed the act in 1974 through which the EPA now sets minimum health-based standards on more than 90 drinking water contaminants, including lead, nitrate, arsenic, disinfection byproducts, pesticides, solvents, and microbial contaminants. The old water infrastructure supply pipes, the sewage lines, the dams, and wastewater treatment facilities need more than triple the funding they currently have to bring them up to grade and to meet our water goals. Now let's talk about the Flint disaster. In 2014, Flint's five-decade practice of piping treated water for its residents from Detroit in favor of a cheaper alternative, temporarily pumping water from the Flint River until a new water pipeline from Lake Huron was built. Although the river water was highly corrosive, Flint officials failed to treat it, and lead leached out from the aging pipes into thousands of homes. So here we have the problem of the aging infrastructure. I read a story about Aaron Stinson that I want to share with you. Aaron Stinson is a a uh, young man, he tries to live a healthy lifestyle. He exercises regularly. He avoids sweets and soda. And he drinks a lot of water for his health. The problem is Stinson lives in Flint, Michigan, born and raised. The water he constantly consumed for his health may have hurt it permanently. Lead, as we now know, contaminated the water there. Stinson is one of many Flint residents who tested positive for lead exposure. At first, Stinson didn't think much of the sharp stomach cramps that bothered him throughout the day and woke him up at night. It left him tired. Strange pain strained his muscles and joints. He blamed it on something he ate, but when he got tested, his blood had almost tripled the maximum allowable lead levels. These figures are similar to the blood of thousands of children of Flint who were poisoned by the bad decisions of state officials and the aging water infrastructure. So the fourth major water issue is unsustainable growth and depletion of water resources. The Ogallala Aquifer underlies the High Plains, the breadbasket of America, portions of eight states such as South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Texas, and spans 175,000 square miles. Water from the aquifer has many uses, but irrigation uses the majority, 57 million gallons a day. The Ogallala also supplies approximately 82% of the drinking water for the overlying states. So you see that in maroon over there. About 27% of the irrigated farmland in the U.S. lies over the aquifer. Currently, the farmland above the aquifer produces 20 billion in food and fiber, about one-fifth of the beef, 
corn and wheat consumed in the United States. But the problem is the water in the aquifer is depleting faster than nature can replenish it. So I read a story about Roger Funk, a farmer in Garden City, Kansas, that I'm going to share with you. In the early 1950s, when Roger Funk started farming near Garden City, Kansas, everyone believed water was inexhaustible. Diesel-powered pumps had replaced windmills, and the number of wells drawing water from the aquifer exploded. At a public meeting in the 1960s, Roger heard the first warnings of the depletion of the reservoir. While other farmers added wells, Roger Funk switched to his crops to wheat and sorghum, changed his farming methods, and hardly uses any water on his 6,000 acres. Today, his community in southern Kansas, 180 miles west of Wichita, is one of the High Plains area's hardest hit by the aquifer's decline. Groundwater level has dropped 150 feet or more, forcing many farmers to abandon their wells. The entire aquifer is already more than 25% dry and may be 70% dry by 2060. The challenge is to stretch the life of the aquifer to benefit future generations of farmers and those who depend on their products. In Garden City, however, the severity of the circumstances is already forcing farmers to take action. They are grappling with how to maintain successful agricultural operations while relying on less and less water, an issue that water users throughout the region and the world must eventually face. What is happening to the Ogallala Aquifer is also happening to aquifers in Africa, Asia, and the Mideast. Again, just as the population of our Earth is exploding, our aquifers are becoming contaminated and depleted, taking thousands of years to refill. Today, the Ogallala Aquifer is being depleted at an annual volume equivalent to 18 Colorado rivers. We need to conserve our groundwater to sustain food production for an increasing population. Changing farming operations by low water use farming and no-till farming is one of the solutions that Roger Funk undertook. He changed his crops from corn to wheat and sorghum, which are less lucrative but more sustainable. Others are planting genetically engineered drought-tolerant crops. He changed his farming methods. Instead of plowing the field, he leaves the stubble in the ground, and that actually prevents moisture loss from the ground. Also, there has been a lot of innovation in irrigation technologies, so they're using more smart technology that's dependent on weather and soil moisture content and drip systems that deliver small doses of water and other nutrients at the roots. Finally, of course, there's money to be made with dwindling supplies and increasing demand. So private capital is increasingly entering the water market. The fifth major issue that we face with our water is ecosystem degradation and its effect on water resources. The wetlands provide many important ecological services, such as supporting biodiversity, but also groundwater recharge and the filtration and purification of water, removing toxic chemicals, sediment, and nutrient runoff. Now, 50% of the world's wetlands have been destroyed, which has a significant impact on our water quality around the globe. The sixth major water issue is water-related disasters. Floods cause economic damage, displacement, loss of safe drinking water in quantity and quality, and long-lasting pollution. According to the United Nations Office of Disaster Risk Reduction, the number of climate-related disasters such as floods doubled during the past 20 years to more than 6,600 events per decade. By 2050, rising populations in flood-prone lands 
climate change, deforestation, loss of wetlands, and rising sea levels can be expected to increase the number of people vulnerable to flood disaster to 2 billion. Now that you have learned about the major global water issues, my question is, which of these is not one of the major, six major water issues? Heavy metal contamination of groundwater is not an issue. It's not one of the six major gl global issues for water. So we've talked about the six major issues. They have a diverse range of implications. I want to focus the rest of this talk on water stress. Remember, water stress is insufficient accessible water in quantity or quality to meet the water demand of the human population. First, I'm going to take you back to elementary school where we learned about the water cycle shown here. We have water on land in the form of bodies of water, groundwater, and other surface water that evaporates, forms clouds that eventually come back as rain, and snow and the cycle continues. The amount of water, quantities of water on earth stay relatively constant. Because water covers three quarters of the earth's surface, it might appear that there's plenty of water to go around and that we will never run out of this valuable resource on which our life depends. In reality, however, we have a tiny amount of usable fresh water. Over 97% of the Earth's water is found in the oceans as salt water. 2% of the Earth's water is stored as fresh water in glaciers, ice caps, and snowy mountain ranges that is inaccessible to us. This leaves only 1% of the Earth's water available to us for our daily supply needs. Our fresh water supplies are either stored in the soil in aquifers or bedrock fractures beneath the ground as groundwater, or in lakes, rivers, and streams on the Earth's surface. Now, the quantities of fresh water available for human consumption is half of the water stress equation, right? How much water is available versus how much are we withdrawing and consuming? So the other half of the equation is our water consumption. Our fresh water is taken from ground or surface water resources such as rivers or lakes to be used for agricultural, industrial, or municipal purposes. So as you can see over here, in terms of the consumption, fresh water consumption, irrigation um, is a major portion of that. Now, let's put the freshwater resources in the context of the growing world population. The population doubles every 40 years, and because the standard of living is growing, increasing around the world, this means global water consumption doubles every 20 years. As you can see in this graph, the available freshwater per capita, that is per person, has decreased significantly in the past 60 years. This map shows the very unequal distribution of water across the globe. Some countries have more than 20,000 cubic meters of water per capita per year, such as much as Canada, whereas other countries at the low end, such as in North Africa, have less than 1,000 cubic meters per capita that is per person. The US is in the low to mid range. The amount of water being withdrawn as a percentage of the total available water reflects the water stress levels. In this case, it is calculated for all different regions of the world. Notice that when the Western and Midwestern United States 
have predominantly high and extremely high water stress levels compared to the rest of the Americas. And in fact, these areas are similar to the water stress levels that you see in India. Question for you is, did this fact surprise you? So our global water supply and its quality are decreasing. We've talked, we've talked already about water stress and the quantity of water, but now we're going to talk about quality for a minute. Melting glaciers are causing sea level rise and the salt water is infiltrating the fresh water in coastal aquifers and estuaries. Pollution, especially from agriculture, industry, and untreated sewage, means decreased water quality. 80% of the world's industrial and municipal wastewater is untreated, which leads to further contamination. Environmental changes can affect water quality. For example, soil erosion caused by development can enter into our wetlands and waterways and increase sediment, which is a major problem. Wetlands help filter our water and deforestation reduces our ability to clean our water. So I've told you about water stress conditions across the globe and that more than 25% of the world population does not have access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Now let's talk about the United States. In the United States, we act like there is no water shortage. Water is cheap, four cents for 10 gallons, and the average American uses 88 gallons per day a lot more than Europe where people use 50 gallons a day or developing countries where they may use 13 gallons a day. In the United States, we water our lush lawns with potable water. It really is not obvious that we have a water shortage here. So this map reflects the water stress in the US. Yellow, orange, and red areas are medium to high water stress which includes most of the central and western United States, as well as the East Coast states. Ensuring access to safe drinking water poses a challenge for the U.S. water systems in the face of aging infrastructure, polluted water sources, and strained community finances that cannot afford cleanups and upgrades. Communities across the country have been impacted by recent cases of impaired water quality. How widespread are violations? Are violations more prevalent in vulnerable communities, such as low-income and rural areas? Do utility characteristics, such as private ownership and origin of source water, influence the likelihood that violations occur? Actually, in 2015, nearly 21 me million people relied on community water systems that violated health-based standards. Both health-based violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act and racial, ethnic, and language vulnerability vary from county to county across the U.S. In certain states, there appears to be a correlation between the racial makeup and the number of community, health, community water health and safety violations as shown on this map in black. So let me ask you another question. What are the biggest impacts on water quality? Water quality is impacted by all these things, agricultural pollution, uh, industrial pollution, destruction of wetlands, and degraded water infrastructure. In summary, first we learned about the six major water issues. Number one, water stress of 
quantity and quality. Number two, water sanitation and hygiene, a wash. That's one of the global sustainable development goals. Uh, water infrastructure and deterioration. Number four, unsustainable population growth and development. Number five, ecosystem destruction. And number six, water-related disasters. After going over those six major water-related issues, we focused on water stress. That is having accessible water in quantity and quality to meet the needs of uh, humans as well as the ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to be uh, continuing with this seminar series. So this was the first lecture on our global water crisis. This is a prelude to some of the upcoming lectures we'll be having on three seminars we'll be having on conserving water inside the home, uh, conserving water outside your home that's in the yard. And uh, then I'll talk about some valley water rebate programs and other resources that may help to fund your next water saving projects. So keep an eye out for those upcoming lectures. Question is, how would you rate today's program? So if you don't have any more questions, then thank you for joining us this morning. And please do keep an eye out for the next three seminars coming up in this series. Thank you.